All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So I hope today's transmission is working okay. I can already see a little lag. So I haven't bought the computer yet. I was still researching. So this is my Windows machine and I hope it is working. If not, then we'll have to <laughs> finish our research for the next computer and just buy it. I'm looking to buy a, a MacBook Pro with M1 processor but I wanted to make sure that it can relay here. So tell me if you can see me correctly. I can see some lag, but is audio okay? And with this, I'm gonna start as well. And apologies for the clickings and the mouse, the trackpad is not really working with the, with the thing, so let's see. Okay, Lynn says I'm a new bean and your audio is good, audio is good. Okay, so let's start. So the discussion today is the following. There is a study done from China that is published on, in May of this year. It was done on patients in January, February timeframe of last year. I think February, March timeframe of last year. It is a retrospective study and what they found was that patients of COVID that became more severe, that became more ill, that needed to be managed with corticosteroids, these patients predominantly had a co-infection of Epstein-Barr virus, or as we know that majority of the adults are already infected with the Epstein-Barr virus. So it was probably a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus. So that is a basic study. And then there is an interesting statement in that study, which I'll show you. That statement is that refractory patients, refractory patients are those patients who are not responding to the medicine and who are not uh, recovering fast enough. Refractory patients were predominantly those that had Epstein-Barr virus, which tells me that long haul, long COVID, could also be, in some patients, contributed the symptoms by the Epstein-Barr virus. Another important thing is that the symptoms of the uh, severe COVID or long COVID are similar to EBV uh, virus as well. And so that was also another interesting thing that they found. And another thing that they found was they, they wanted to understand why does this happen? Why does EBV become reactivated? And what they found was that the cytotoxic T cell, the T cell that are responsible to kill the infected cells, those T cells are reduced by COVID. So when the cytotoxic T cells are reduced, that causes the infected cells of any kind to proliferate, which also means that infected EBV cells, Epstein-Barr virus infected cells, would also proliferate and that would allow the Epstein-Barr virus to spread as well. So these are the important highlights. This is the summary. So now let's start a discussion and we'll go from there. So first of all, let me show you my latest painting. So I tweeted this painting out over this uh, weekend as well. I had made two versions of this. The painting is called Evening Lights. And there is a place here near my place called Portola Valley. And I, I was going there with my brother and we took a picture which I used to make this painting then. So here is the um, evening lights and now let's start a discussion. Let me show you the study as well. Here is the study. And in this study, here is the marked up PDF of the study. So if you see here, they're talking about, it's a small study. So let's actually look at the studies uh, limitations first. So we know that where do they have criticism? The limitations are that number one, so here this blue one, and my apologies on this Windows machine, I cannot do pinch and zoom in and zoom out. So this is what we'll work with. So they say for this limitations, our study had several limitations. First, our study was a retrospective study. That means they're looking backwards. We could not confirm the time of EBV infection. 
So because it's a retrospective study, they cannot actually continue to take Epstein-Barr virus uh, tests for a patient who is admitted. So they don't have control on the retros retrospective uh, cohort. Second, the sample size in a study is small. Third, most COVID-19 patients did not test the EBV DNA. So they were they did have some test for the EBV, but not all tests. So they did not test for the DNA. That means that early antigen detection was not there, which is a very important thing for the reactivation understanding. And fourth, because of the small sample size and most included patients were mild cases, we could not analyze the statistical association between anti-EBV antibodies and the mortality of COVID-19. So they could not identify or detect any link that is it possible that patients of COVID who have also the activation or reactivation of EBV, are they have a greater propensity to develop cytokine storm and die? They do show greater propensity to develop cytokine storm, but do they end up dying more as well? This is one part that the authors could not see. So with this limitation in mind, there is data I have uh, marked it. And once again, my apologies for this mouse noise. Uh, this is just how it is for today. So here is the data I'm going to start. Fortunate for us, this uh, software that I use, Mischief, it can actually run on Windows as well. So I could give you a similar experience, as, as similar as possible. So here is the study. January 9th to February 29th is the study's time. I'm looking here just to make sure that things are okay. <laughs> this, this is a new. Tell me how is the relay. Okay, so study is designed. It's a single center, small study, 67 patients. It's a retrospective study. So they looked at the patient's records instead of starting a new study. And it is in a hospitalized patients. It's a study in a hospital, which kind of already give you an idea that these are going to be the patients who are a little more severe compared to outpatient. So what happens in the outpatient? Do outpatient patients also get Co, uh, co infection or reactivation of EBV, that is not known. And so there is a bias already that the patients are a little severe, severe uh, compared to the outpatient. Summary is this, and this is very, very important. The summary <laughs> is, excuse me, that 55.2% of these patients, so again, small number, 67, 55.2% had viral capsid IgM, viral capsid IgM. IgM depicts acute infection. So IgM were positive. So that means either there was a co-infection or there was a reactivation. So you can, you can have this comment that, hey, in the reactivation, normally we see IgG and that will be correct. However, it is possible that when the reactivation occurs and the lytic phase starts again, and we have done this discussion in our last two, three talks. So I don't want to go back in that uh, discussion. If you have not watched those, please go back to last two, three lectures where I've discussed these phases and what happens in there. So in the lytic phase, as the virus breaks the cell and comes out, it is possible that it can be picked up by a new B cell who would take that virus as a new virus and start making IgM as well. So it is possible to start seeing IgM again in reactivation too. So they saw IgM. What does that tell us? Reinfection, reactivation. The other thing, this is interesting, three times, three times or three folds, higher risk of fever with the symptoms. So they saw that patients who did not have co-infection of EBV or reactivation of EBV, they had lesser, lesser of those patients had fever compared to those patients who had fever, they had more, uh, three times more patients of EBV co-infection had fever. Then this is also, the next one is also important, C-reactive protein. So we know that the C-reactive protein, it is a protein that is released by liver 
in response to acute inflammation or acute injury or acute stress, including infections. So C-reactive proteins presence means there is some infection going on or there is inflammation or stress going on. It is an acute phase protein. So C-reactive protein was more or higher in quantity or concentration in EBV co-infected or reactivated patients. Similarly, aspartate aminotransferase, AST, which is a liver enzyme, usually AST and ALT we do to figure out if the liver is under stress or not, if, if the liver is getting damaged or not. And that enzyme was also increased in those patients that had EBV co-infection or reactivation. So that's very interesting. And 55% patients have that. So half of these severe patients. Then they also saw that more patients were of the EBV co-infection had to be given steroids. Although this part, they did not have a statis statistical significance here. So that means we cannot claim that the EBV co-infection or reactivation must necessitate steroid, meaning that must become severe. But they saw that a higher number of patients with EBV needed steroids. Okay, so this is once again just me struggling with this software today, so please don't mind. I'm going to increase. It would, my key... <laughs> you'll laugh about this. I did not know how to use those uh, uh, the keyboard keys correctly. So there is a difference in the keys. And so when I would press certain keys, the patterns that I'm used to working with Mac, the, the thing would just go zoom in, zoom out, and that's how this happened. Anyways, details. So now the summary is done. You, If you just wanted to understand what is going on here, we know that from the study, it's a small study. We know that it is possible that the patients who have EBV co-infection or reactivation can tip a person more towards a severe disease, one, and number two, towards the refractory disease. That means long COVID symptoms could be at least more than half of the patients would be having EBV reactivation. And I would add one more conjecture here. If EBV could be reactivated and cause this issue, then CMV could be reactivated as well. So herpes viruses could be reactivated. That means maybe other viruses and, and uh, fungi as well. But the study here is about Epstein-Barr virus. So 90% of the adults have EBV. This is what we know. Most common virus, we talked about it. Reactivation can occur in immunocompetent and immunocompromised. However, most of the immunocompetent persons can take care of the reactivated virus or the infected cells without much symptoms. However, somebody who may be immunocompromised, and here immunocompromised doesn't mean HIV or doesn't mean, uh, let's say, cancer therapies. If we are down, let's say we are diabetic and diabetes is out of control, or let's say we are down because we have a recent infection, COVID is a severe enough infection to kind of compromise our immune system. So I would say instead of just immunocompromised, if immune system is under stress, then reactivation can occur. So here, if you see a immunocompetent person does have the EBV virus on them, 90% of the adults have them, but they are still fine. On the other hand, a person who might be sick and their immune system under stress may get EBV reactivated. I pressed some button. Okay, so now once the EBV is reactivated, we know that EBV itself can cause infectious mononucleosis and the symptoms there, and we discussed that. In addition to that, these are important things to note for COVID. One, we know that EBV in African countries have been causing Burkitt's lymphoma. And what is that? That is the cancer of the B cells. And we have talked about that before, although not exactly how the cancer occurs of the B cells. But we know that EBV can trigger the B cells to continue to divide and become immortal. EBV is also associated 
with nasopharyngeal cancers. EBV also Epstein-Barr virus causes lymphomas or lymphoproliferation that is increased in number of natural killer cells and T cells. So they are it's known to do that as well. Now the study had a cohort of 67 people. So keep this in mind that EBV can do those things. Median age of the cohort was 37 years of age, although they were people from 23 years to 81 years of age. Females were 52%. Now this is important when they decided who will participate in this study or who will they take in this study. Again, it's a retrospective study. So they were looking at the records and deciding who to include. They were looking at patients who had developed symptoms to hospitalization within four days median. That is, if somebody developed symptoms today and within four days they ended up in a hospital, me median four days, 50% of them, then they selected them. The reason that they wanted to keep or include those patients in the study that were getting sick before two weeks or within the two weeks boundary was because sometimes EBV resolves in two weeks. So they wanted to make sure that the patients they are looking at are those who have COVID plus have recent EBV, if at all. Because of that, majority of the patients here were included who became sick within the last two weeks and did not become sick before the two weeks. Now, it was interesting that 11 patients, again, small study, I'll keep repeating it, 16.4% of the patients had comorbidities as well, 11%, 11, 16 percent, so not a lot. 6% of them, of the patients, not of them, 6% of the overall, 6% of the 67, had cardiovascular disease, 6% had hypertension, 4.5% had diabetes, 3% had chronic lung disease, sorry, liver disease, and I should write in or here, and then 1% had digestive diseases. So that was the cohort structure. They also found that fever was in 61% of the patients overall. However, patients who had fever, majority of them had EBV or Epstein-Barr virus reactivation or co-infection as well. 52% had dry cough, although the, these symptoms, cough, fatigue, myalgia, anorexia, they could not have statistically significant relationship to EBV. But I hope that you can see fatigue and myalgia, even anorexia, can be Epstein-Barr virus symptoms as well. Here is what they found in serology. This is what is interesting. This is the meat of the whole discussion. So they looked at the following antibodies. They looked at viral capsid IgM. Viral capsid IgM will tell us acute infection. Most of the time, primary infection. However, it has been seen in the reinfection or activation or even chronic. The percentage of people who show IgM at reactivation is usually low, but you can see it. So here, IgM was shown for Epstein-Barr virus IgM for COVID-19 hospitalized patients was in 55.2% patients. So this 55.2% will represent either altogether new infection, so that will be called a co-infection, or a reactivation. Then 94% had viral cas capsid IgG. So we talked about it. IgG, viral capsid, is an indication of a past infection. So the, the virus arrived in a person's body, EBV. They attacked the cells that had the virus. IgM was made in the beginning, then IgM went away. 
in a couple of weeks, four weeks, and then IgG was started to being made, and that would continue to be made for a for the lifelong. In that time frame, then the cells, the B cells, will become memory B cells as well and go and live in the bone marrow or other tissues. And as they become memory cells, they will start producing EBNA, IgG. And we discussed it, EBNA, you can think of that as a sleeping B cell snoring. So about EBV, a B cell that can attack an EBV virus and when it is sleeping, it releases EBNA. What is EBNA? EBNA is a viral antigen that is produced in a memory B cell. And why is it produced? Virus is the Epstein-Barr virus is trying to keep itself replicating with the cell. So this enzyme, EBNA, helps the virus replication when a B cell divides. So when that viral protein is made from a memory cell, that viral protein can be detected and other B cells can make antibodies against that. So EBNA antibodies are an indicator of a memory B cell. This is a latent phase memory B cell. So 95% of the patients had latent phase. So you can say that 95% of the, this whole cohort were infected at some point in their life with Epstein-Barr virus. Now, if 95%, so think about it, 67 patient total, 95% did have EBNA. That means at some point in their life, they had the virus. And then another 55, they are not excluded, they are overlapping the 95. 55% had IgM as well. So there may be a, a few percentage, at most 5% with the new infection, but the re remaining were previously infected and now active. That is a very important thing to note. At least 45% here. So let's say this is 95%. 5% of this 55 was new. Then the remaining 50.2% were existing EBV cases who had EBV in them somewhere in the past, and now their EBV had become reactivated. So co-infection or reactivation. In addition to that, if you see here, 53.7% of the patients had a combination of various IgMs and IgGs. And what is that combination? Some of them had IgM, that is acute viral capsid IgM, plus viral capsid IgG. That means it may be current infection on the resolution site. IgG is being produced. Plus EBNA IgG. That means the cells may be becoming memory cells or they were memory cell and now they're waking up. It could be either. And no IgM for EA. So this could be an acute infection co-infection with COVID, which is now giving rise to memory cells and that infection itself is resolving. That is this indication. Then they saw some patients who had IgM positive plus EBNA positive. EBNA is an example of a memory cell that is in, in a patient of EBV, of the past EBV. And now they have become IgM positive as well for VC. That means there is reactivation. Similarly, they saw in some patients one more combination, and that is EBNA plus EA. And we talked about this last time as well. EBNA would simply mean that the cell was sleeping. And EA's presence means this cell is now waking up. So all of these here are possible examples of either reactivation starting like this or reactivation occurring like this or reactivation has occurred or infection has occurred in a new Epstein-Barr virus naive person or susceptible person with COVID and now it is towards the memory.
So they saw almost all cases. So if I summarize this table, what they saw was in some patient new infection occurred. And in some patients, a previous infection became active as well. But overall, 55.2% people had active EBV infection. It may have been reactivation or it may have been coactivation or co-infection. So that is important. So now this is another important data point, although this data point is not statistically significant, and that is out of all of those 67 patients, 10 patients ended up in ICU. Out of these 10, seven had EBV. Again, co-infection or reactivation. None of the patients fortunately died in this study. So now the question is, why did this happen? So here, uh, let me see if I can increase the size of this one. So why did this happen? Look what happens is, <laughs> I try to play with the keyboard keys here. Okay, so here is what happened. We know that for Epstein-Barr virus, there is a lytic phase where the virus is actively replicating inside a cell and then it is coming out of the cell. The cell is breaking down in that process. And this usually happens to B cells. This virus usually destroys B cells and the epithelial cells. So in the case of reactivation, it would not probably go to the epithelial cells. It's probably going to be more causing damage to the B cells. Those B cells here, if you look to the left side, those B cells that are infected, these will be taken care of by this path. That is T helper one path. That is cytotoxic T cell path. We know this that cytotoxic T cells are responsible to clear out the infected B cells. But we also know, and authors have connected many, referred many studies that show this, we also know that COVID reduces, at least temporarily, it reduces the cytotoxic T cell counts. And we know how, how does that happen. When COVID goes this route, this route's activation automatically destroys or suppresses the other side. In COVID, we know that there is a reduction of the cytotoxic T cell count. Now, this cytotoxic T cell count or number of these cytotoxic T cells are important to kill the sick B cells infected B cell. So when the T cells themselves are low in number, then their capability to go and clear out the B cells or keep the B cells suppressed, those B cells that are infected by EBV, that capability reduces. So to give you an example, let's say I have EBV and EBV becomes active every so often. And as soon as it becomes active, the T cell, the cytotoxic T cells jump up, they go and find those cells and they kill them. And I don't even know. In majority of the people, when the reactivation occurs, cytotoxic T cell kill the sick B cells and patient doesn't even have symptoms. They don't even know this happened. But now think about it. If I got COVID and I got EBV activation, now I need cytotoxic T cells to go and clear out the sick B cells. But because of COVID, my T cells, cytotoxic T cells are less. That means there is less capability to clear out the reinfected or activated, reactivated B cells. And that is how EBV springs up. This is the cause. From uh, This is their conjecture. So then they also saw that the C-reactive protein is increased. Alanine uh, aspartate aminotransferase is increased as well. And they saw that the severe patients had these numbers up. So they thought that patients who were developing the cytokine storm, these patients 
a higher number of them had EBV active, active as well. The second thing that they saw was the refractory patients, the patients who were difficult to manage, they were not responding well. These patients also had EBV reactivation, which means it is possible that there are refractory patients who are not in the hospital that is long COVID. And they are long COVID because it is their EBV that is also active. So does this mean that all long COVID are EBV reactive? No. But does this mean that long COVID could be long COVID because there is EBV reactivation? Yes. Will that become corrected? Yes. So as the COVID's effect go away, as the immune system starts bouncing back, it is going to start taking care of the EBV6 cells as well. However, it does pose a risk to the person's health. And if these cytotoxic T cells do not bounce back in time, do not bounce back in the right number, do not take care of these sick B cells in time, then the person would have the symptoms for a longer period of time. This also means that the EBV-related cancers could become, so this is, I'm saying could, so that means I could totally be wrong. EBV-related cancers may become more prevalent as well if this situation is not taken care of. And we all know how to manage the long COVID. So I hope um, I hope that the audio was fine. I hope the video was fine. I hope this worked out. Uh, if not, please tell me. Uh, I will finish my research on computers and just go and buy another Mac. Um, with this, please do me a favor. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. One is to buy me a coffee. You don't need to use a PayPal. Or you can use PayPal to support as well. Or you can be a patron. And thank you very much to all the patrons that we have so far. So I'm going to hang up now and I would come back for a chit chat. I am a little lost though, so I'm not able to respond very well because this whole window setup is a little different. I'll become used to it in another day or so. So I'm going to hang up and we'll do chit chat.